Here are a few of the most isolated communities on Earth. But just wait until you hear how densely packed this island is. Number 9. Makingo Island Where does Africa's smallest conflict take place? That would be on Makingo Island, an extremely small yet densely populated island located on Lake Victoria in Africa. The island is only half an acre in size, but has over 131 residents. The people living on the island are mostly fishermen. If you can't tell from the pictures, let's just point out that the island is overcrowded and there isn't a lot of space between the houses. Although the island is extremely tiny, it is a great spot for fishermen to do business. The surrounding waters are full of Nile perch, which is a valuable export to Europe. And that's why this island is home to Africa's smallest conflict. The Rock Island, with its poorly constructed huts, a tiny port, some bars, and an open-air casino, is heavily contested by Kenya and Uganda. What's really at stake are the valuable fishing waters surrounding the island. Many different species of fish have greatly diminished over the years around Lake Victoria because of overfishing and other factors. But increasingly profitable species such as Nile perch are still plentiful in the deep waters surrounding Makingo. That makes the island a valuable and unique fishing hub. Uganda started to send armed police and their marines to Makingo to tax the fishermen and offer them protection against pirates in 2004 when the island was still barely inhabited. Does this sound like a mafia tactic yet? So the Kenyan fishermen started complaining to the Kenyan government that they were being harassed by the Ugandan forces. Uganda was accusing the Kenyan fishermen of illegally fishing in Ugandan waters. In response, the Kenyan government deployed their marines to Makinko. The price of Nile perch has steadily increased over the last five years. It's become an even bigger multi-million dollar export. And the rising price has brought more and more fishermen to the island. So what's the situation now? Kenya and Uganda decided to create a joint committee to determine the border in 2016, relying on maps dating from the 1920s. However, nothing has come out of the committee. They're still fighting it out. In the meantime, the island is co-managed by both countries, but tensions still occasionally flare up. Number 8. Aogashama Island Aogashama Island is the toughest island to reach among the islands in Japan. The island is located only around 222 miles away from the center of Tokyo, and that's why the island is under the administration by the city government of Tokyo. The entire island is quite small, it's just 2.1 miles in length and 1.5 miles in width. The whole island only has one postal address and packages and mail are delivered by the recipient's names only. There aren't any restaurants on the island except for a couple of Japanese bars. So people who are staying at the hotels are actually served food by the hotel. There isn't much produced on the island, but it turns out that some families on the island actually produce shochu, a Japanese liquor. And shochu produced on Aogashama is known for its quality. So how many people live on the island? The population is roughly estimated at around 180 people. The island's population has decreased steadily over the past 70 years, from 450 villagers to 178 villagers, according to most recent census. However, it's understandable because the island is home to a volcano. That's a pretty good reason why this island is so scarcely populated. Aogashama is still considered an active Class C volcano, although it last erupted in the 1780s. That wiped out half of the island's population, and it forced the remaining inhabitants to leave. After the eruption, no one lived on the island for almost 50 years. However, having a volcano on the island isn't the worst thing, especially if it hasn't erupted in over 230 years. They're blessed with hot springs and natural saunas because of the volcano. It's a popular thing to bring food and cook it by placing it on top of one of the natural sauna steam vents. The saunas actually already have a collection of pots and pans ready for anyone to use to cook their food. Number 7. La Rincanada La Rincanada is the highest town in the whole world, and it's a literal gold mine, but we'll get to that later. La Rincanada is located over 3 miles above sea level at 16,732 feet. La Rincanada in southern Peru is home to roughly 50,000 people. It's a secluded town that doesn't see many people except for the residents that live there. It's incredibly difficult to get to the town. There aren't scheduled bus routes between La Rinconada and the larger nearby towns, and travelers have to prepare for the altitude before making their ascent. At the town's elevation, visitors very commonly encounter ailments such as altitude sickness, headaches, nausea, or shortness of breath if they don't properly prepare. 
The town was once only a temporary settlement, but it's quickly grown in recent years. From 2001 to 2009, the town's population grew by an astonishing 230%. Why? Because word got out that the town sat on top of a literal gold mine. When the price of gold increased in the early 2000s, miners flocked to the town to try and get rich. But these aspirations came with a cost. The miners and their families had to endure extreme conditions on a daily basis. The economy of La Rincanada revolves around the mine, as gold is pretty much the only resource the city has. The crazy thing is the work arrangement workers have with the company that owns the mines. Miners work through the month and receive no pay. However, after their 30-day shift, they're welcome to leave the mine hauling as much ore as they can possibly carry on them. The catch, of course, is that there's no way to tell how much gold, if any, is present in the ore they lug home. It's all a matter of luck. What's even crazier is the town itself. For a town that has tens of thousands of people living there, it still somehow doesn't have running water or sewage system. The city planners were completely unprepared for the flood of hopeful miners in such a short amount of time. No permanent city services were ever anticipated. With no running water or sewage system, that also means that there's no trash service. Residents either bury the trash or just burn it in the streets. Obviously, there are plenty of residents who will just leave trash anywhere. Despite the abysmal conditions and shady pay structure, the population holds steady. The Peruvian government doesn't seem to want to take control of the situation. The mining company obviously doesn't want to disrupt its practically free labor. As long as the gold keeps coming, the highest city in the world will stay. Number 6. St. Helena St. Helena is easily one of the most isolated places in the world. It's so isolated, the journey there is a journey in and of itself. Back just a few years ago, it used to take anywhere from 7 to 14 days just to get to this British overseas territory. For example, in order to get to St. Helena from London, this is what you needed to do. First, you had to fly to Cape Town, South Africa, which is around a 12-hour non-stop flight. Then, you would have to take a boat to the island that took 5 to 7 days because it's basically in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. But thankfully, this isolated island now has an airport, so it's much easier to get there. However, that doesn't mean that people actually go there a lot. Currently, its nickname is the world's most useless airport, but the British government is hoping that will change with its $375 million investment. Tourism is just exactly what St. Helena needs. Not just so the UK government can stop giving aid to the islanders, but also to allow them to start new businesses. There are almost 4,500 residents on St. Helena. The average annual income is only a little more than $9,000. If tourism takes off, it would change the lives of people on the island. So, what's there to do on the island? Well, for one, there's 45 square miles of exploration. It's kind of a lost paradise because there's very little tourism to speak of on the island. The island has essentially an unspoiled natural environment with ecosystems ranging from rainforest to desert. Its waters are present with numerous opportunities for whale and dolphin watching. St. Helena also has a lot of historical significance. This island was the place of exile for Napoleon. This is where the best promise for tourism comes in. St. Helena currently has a small amount of French visitors who've come to see the sites linked to their country's former emperor. These sites include Longwood House, where Napoleon was living until he passed in 1821. Another site is the Briars, his first residence on the island. The Valley of the Tomb is where he was buried before his body was repatriated. Here's a fun fact. The Napoleonic estates are actually under direct French administration and enjoy extraterritorial status. The French flag is raised over the estates and France maintains a consul on the island that takes care of the preservation. Number five. Palmerston Island Palmerston Island is known as the island at the end of the world. It's a small Pacific island that's visited by a supply ship only twice in an entire year. That's because the total population is just around 60. Most of the residents are actually the descendants of one single man who settled on this island over 150 years ago, William Marsters. Part of the Cook Islands, Palmerston is one of a handful of islands connected by a coral reef that surrounds the waters of a central lagoon. But within this entire area, the reef sits too high in the water for seaplanes to land. And outside of it, the ocean is just too rough. It's also too far from anywhere for a normal helicopter to fly to, so by boat is the only way in. The extreme journey prevents all but the most determined of visitors from ever reaching the island. It's just a tiny area of land surrounded by thousands of miles of ocean. 
If you ever come to this island, the only thing you'll see are the locals. This island receives all the basic amenities in a very limited amount. The island only has power for a few hours a day, and that means internet for only a few hours a day. Aside from exports, government jobs are the primary source of income for the residents of Palmerston. Three family heads and an equal number of deputies form the island council, the local governing body. The national government essentially compensates the islanders for their work governing themselves. However, fishing takes up most of the day for the Palmerstonians. Fish is their only export, and it's also what the staple food is. The locals also grow starchy staples such as taro and sweet potatoes. To further supplement the Palmerston diet, they also raise pigs and chickens. Whatever they don't make, they get from the supply ship. However, what these guys don't get on the supply ship are definitely some crazy exotic foods, such as pufferfish or hakaro, which is fermented shark. Find out more in our video on the most dangerous foods people actually eat. For some residents, Palmerston's isolation is a reason to leave. Between 1950 and 1970, the population was as high as 300, but now it's just in the 60s. With such a small number of residents, many of the younger residents are hoping to leave for cities hundreds of miles away where life is more modern. But most importantly, there's a bigger choice of potential spouses. Number 4. Whittier, Alaska The town of Whittier, Alaska might be the most remote and hard to access town in the US. The only way to get to Whittier by land is through a tunnel. And if you want to get to Whittier by tunnel, you'll have to get there during the day because the tunnel closes at night. Also, the tunnel takes turns running in opposite directions every 30 minutes. The total population of the town is just around 220 people. So how did this town come to be? The US Army built Begich Towers and Buckner Building as a home base to be used during the Cold War. When the Army decided that it didn't really need the Alaskan outpost, they basically abandoned the buildings. The residents that stayed behind just took over the buildings. However, these days, Buckner Building sits unused. Interestingly enough, Begich Towers and Buckner Building were the tallest buildings in the state of Alaska at one point. One reason so few people live here is because of the weather. Winter winds can easily blow at speeds of 80 miles per hour, and snowfall can go as high as 55 feet annually. And that's why almost all the residents live in one big building called Begich Towers. The towers has everything they need under one roof, and that's why Whittier's nickname is the town under one roof. There's a laundromat, a convenience store, and also a health clinic. There's even a church in the basement and a police station on the main floor. The residents of the town help support many different industries. Commercial fishing and tourism are also staples of the town. The annual visiting population is actually over 700,000 people according to the town's website. That's because there's actually a cruise ship that visits the town by sea. If you want to visit and stay overnight, there is June's Whittier condo suites on the top two floors. Resident June Miller outfitted all of her bed and breakfast rooms with binoculars. A lot of residents keep binoculars to watch the natural wildlife, but according to June, they also use binoculars to find out if their wife or husband is at the local bar. Number 3. Supai Village Imagine a place that still gets its mail by mule. That's Supai Village, the only town left in America that gets mail this way. Despite being one of the most visited places in the U.S., the Grand Canyon area in Arizona still has a secret little town located at the bottom of Havasu Canyon. It's the only town inside the Grand Canyon, and it's located deep inside a 3,000-foot deep hole. The only way to reach Supai is by foot, helicopter, or by mules, and that's why mail is still delivered the old-fashioned way. All of the residents get their mail by mule train. That's a series of linked mules carrying packages and letters. Supai is home to the Havasupai tribe, which is the smallest Indian tribe in the U.S. with a total population of just around 600. They've lived in the area for more than a thousand years, but of course they've had to fight for their right to stay on their land. The name Havasupai means people of the blue-green water. The tribe has spent the last 10 centuries farming and hunting within the canyon, but these days the tribe is known for their traditional cultural life and their iconic coiled baskets. Just a little over 200 people live in Supai, according to the latest census. The secrecy of the village and the waterfalls of the Havasupai Creek are a couple of the main factors why tourism is rising in Supai. Visitors can stay at the Havasupai Lodge or just do it the more traditional way of camping. Although tourism makes up a large portion of the village's income, tourists are constantly reminded that the region is at Mother Nature's mercy. Flash floods are quite common. During a major storm in 2010, 143 tourists had to evacuate and three pack horses were swept away. It took years for the village to make post-flood repairs. 
Number two, Santa Cruz del Islote. Santa Cruz del Islote. Island is an island that's filled with adventure, thrill, joy, and energy. Why is the island that way? That's because it's an island that has a youth population of over 65%. The island is located in Colombia's San Bernardo Archipelago. Here on the island, a population of up to roughly 1,200 people live on the island the size of two football fields in the middle of the Caribbean. This is easily one of the most densely populated islands on the planet. Houses are built extremely close to each other because space is at a premium here. Around 115 houses are crammed onto the island. The economy is based on fishing services and a bit of tourism. A lot of locals work at luxury hotels on neighboring islands. The people living on the island are quite happy with their way of life and they live it on their own terms and pace. For example, the nightlife on the island is iconic as people often party a lot on the island, sometimes for as long as three days. However, Santa Cruz del Islote is also poor. There is no clean drinking water or sewage. That means that there are problems handling trash and pollution in general. But interestingly, with that sort of poverty, there's essentially zero crime on the island. That's definitely a big difference with the high rate of crimes in other poor cities and towns that are bigger. The houses are wide open, but there are literally zero cases of robbery or theft on the island. The reason why is because there's a strong community spirit here. Anyone that needs help can count on the support of their neighbors. So there's really no need to steal. Plus, with such a small community, people are going to find out anyways. And that's the reason why the locals decided not to have any kind of police on the island. They actually think that having police on the island would only make matters worse for the residents. As for the future of the island, there are concerns that the island will be gone with the rising sea levels. But despite that, the people are proud to live there. They claim that it's more than just people living on an island because it's a culture, a way of life. They don't want to be any place else. Well, that's the older generation anyways. The internet has made the younger generation a lot more aware of what's off the island. Apparently, a lot of them plan to leave to build their lives off the island. Number one. Longyearbyen. Located just 800 miles from the North Pole, Longyearbyen is a small town located in northern Norway. It's supposedly the world's northernmost town. The town is located deep within the Arctic Circle, and it doesn't see sunlight for around four months of the year. Considering this is the northernmost town in the world, the temperature here is literally absolutely freezing. With average low temperatures going all the way down to negative 6 degrees Fahrenheit in February, it's an extremely cold and very difficult for people to live. But that's still not exactly stopping people from moving there. 121 people moved to Longyearbyen the first half of 2019. This represents the biggest growth for the town since 2009. As if the cold isn't enough, people also have to deal with polar bears around town. They're the reason why the administration of the town encourages its residents to carry firearms with them at all times. So how did the town start? It used to be a coal mining town. It was actually first known as Longyear City until around 1926. That's because the town was established by and named after John Monroe Longyear. Watch this next video to learn about the most dangerous foods people actually eat.